Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession here at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we're joined by Dermot O'Brien, the CHRO of ADP. Dermot, thank you very much for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. So we've talked a lot about the changing nature of HR and HR professionals. We even last night we're talking about the generational switch in it, yeah. and and you have talked about the need for a new type of HR professional. Can you can you say more about that? Uh, yeah, look, I think we all have to evolve, and and for me, it's really around um, being a more rounded. HR person in the sense that my generation, we were very much the art form of HR, probably very little science or analytics backing up a lot of what we did or, or suggested be done. And I think we're getting, we're getting much more rigorous, uh, so a lot more discipline being introduced. And I think that introduces a new, a new um, cadre of talent that can come in and really help us advance that in a much bigger way. Uh, so I think technology, analytics, insights, um, so that HR can truly become what I think it needs to be and be a key sensing organization for any company or any organization. What, what do you mean by that, a sensing organization? So the, the ability to be able to sense how things are going, where things are going. I think today's model, uh, we delegate a lot of that um, interaction to managers and the relationship between managers and employees. Um, but the um, some of the oversight functions. So if you say the chief human resources officer, you know my job in some ways should be what's my oversight and insight. Like this, I should have the ability to be able to see kind of what's going on appropriately. Um, and I think we've delegated a lot of that. So sensing is being putting in place uh, processes, data points, so that you can actually um, answer questions like, um, you know, who are our best people, how are they feeling. Um, where are they leaving us for? Uh, who are we, you know, who are we hiring from? How successful are those people versus others that we've kind of brought up, you know, more through maybe a summer intern program or whatever it might be. I think the ability to be able to look at your human capital flow and be able to sort of have insights or course correction, having that level of, of insight and intelligence, I think we're working towards that, but we're not, I think, anywhere yet near where we need to be. And you were talking about, I think, uh, having this human capital and understanding this flow of where it's coming from to help the entire business, no longer just thinking about people. I, I mean, not no longer just thinking about the HR function, but thinking about sure. how these people affect the organizational outcomes. Is, is, am I hearing you right on that? Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of line loss between you know businesses over here that could really use the talent that's over there. And a lot of that's historical around how business units are structured and where the the profit and loss statements are built and what people focus on. And so again, I think part of the role of HR is to help thread an organization together so that the maximum human value can be attributed for maximum client impact. Um, and you have to do things that break down human behavior. So a lot of people, no matter what we say about encouraging people to grow, they still, if that person's getting them great results, they kind of want to hug them uh, and they want to keep them. And that may not be in the best interest of that person or in the best interest of the company they work for. So having the sensing mechanisms to be able to nudge, whether it's behavioral economics, which I think is also mm -hmm. a piece that's going to be entered in here, sort of nudging managers, nudging associates when it's time to think about doing something different, but giving them the full array of the company's roles to do that, as opposed to historically, if everyone was in silos, they would only see a, you know, a short list of things. So this sounds like to be great sensors, and then great communicators, is, must clearly be part of this also. This sounds like a very different skill set than one in the past. I know you have talked a lot about where you think this HR yeah. function is going. So yeah. where, where do we get this kind of talent in the future? So I think we're going to get it from some different places. Um, we could get it from sales, uh, which sales has turned out, and I would say even marketing. You know, marketing is, has transformed itself over the last 15, 20 years from a function that was very like HR, which was probably more art form and you know, uh, creative, but it was kind of hard to put your, you know, your finger on. Now it's very digital. I mean, they've really, you know, kind of, you know, went from sort of mm -hmm. left to right on that. And I think HR has not moved along at that clip. Uh, so I think you'll find that marketing, because because a lot of things around, like you said, communicating and, and marketing a position, having a, 
uh, a brand on something. And I think HR needs uh, better brand ambassadors and architects. Uh, but I also say um, uh, data scientists, a lot more math-oriented people, uh, behavioral you know, economists. Mm -hmm. uh, in one of our labs in Chelsea, New York City, we have, a, we have an anthropologist um, you know, that's kind of helping out just about how humans interact with each other and with their environment. So I think it's a, it, is, it is more of a scientific um, um, array of skills, I think, than we've ever had before. And obviously, and lastly, technology. You know, people who can really understand that in this new world, you know, technologies, you know, humans love connectivity. Technology connects people. And so I actually think it's this advancement in technology that will create great human connectivity. It makes that sound like a, you know, a contradiction, that technology will make us more human, but I think they will make organizations more human. So it's a, it's a really interesting way to think about it. And where does HR fit into that? Is HR the driving function that creates this connectivity across the organization? Is that the sensing part that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I think we should, be, we should be certainly leading the charge, but if we've got partners who can lead it with us, this isn't about ownership. You know, it's HR versus, you know, it's probably HR and. Um, and I think that's how teams win, by the way. Um, so I think we've got to be driving that. And I have an expression I use called HR architected business led. And the reason I say that is because I want to make sure HR understands its role. Um, we can architect culture outcomes, leadership capability outcomes, compensation outcomes. And we know we've got the expertise how to, how to, how to do that. Um, but if the business doesn't own it at the end of the day, and right at you know, where it meets the road, um, then, it's, then it, you really haven't had the maximum impact that you could have. One of, the, one of the things that you are known for having delivered or changed at ADP is, I believe, the way we discussed it, ADP was not necessarily a, a performance-driven organization, at least at the individual level, for a while. And you have really changed that to more of a performance-driven group. Can you talk a little bit about that process and sure. what that meant? Yeah, we've always had it, and last night I mentioned it around sales. Sales at ADP is world class. It's very performance oriented. We had fifty seven thousand people. That's just eight thousand. So you got about fifty thousand people that it was sort of different approaches were taken. Um, you, it's good to have HR be able to help these things, but you need a good platform to be on. And what I mean by that is you need the support. So the CEO is very much in sync uh, on this. So in fact, when we had a dinner during what I would call the dating game of the interview process, you know, he sort of said, "Don't I need someone who can." help me really drive a greater performance culture and really answer the question, do we have the talent uh, of, you know, for our future, to meet our future? And so that's really where I've kind of focused a lot of my efforts on. And, and so it's great when you have the CEO backing you to do it. So I think that he, he made it easy and therefore the organization you know, kind of got in line pretty quickly and we tried not to be too uh, much in people's faces about it. But, but ADP was not a threaded company four and a half years ago. Today it is. We have one approach to how we do do this. We can, uh, we have great participation rates in everything that we do. We know how our top people are feeling about these changes that are being made, um, and we have a lot of human uh, pieces around it too in terms of calibration process. So we'd have peer leaders talking about their talent. So it's not just a leader like we talked about last night right. who right. says my person's awesome and, and I want you know all the great ratings for them. Uh, you actually have others putting pressure on that say, well, they're good, but they're not as awesome as you think they are, which is good because you're better off having an honest, balanced view on a person than an overstated or understated you know, view on them. So that's, that's what we've sort of done. We've architected that through a lot of you know, very deliberate steps. And one of the really interesting uh, pieces of that conversation that we were having that I have, yeah. had not thought about before was moving it towards a performance-based organization for everybody, not just sales, as you yeah. said, but not making it such a star system that you leave anybody behind. Yeah. Can you describe that challenge and, yeah. and why that's important? I mean, I think it's important if you're gonna have an inclusive organization, if you wanna get the most out of all the people that are in your organization. And yes, when you're trying to drive greater performance differentiation, you'll always be sort of saying, well, who are the top, pick a number, 10, 20%. We go after the top 20%. Um, but you have to be careful not to make them so special you know, um, do such great things for them that you're taking all of that away from, let's call it the mass middle of key contributors, you know, to your organization. You could really alienate the majority of your company if you either intentionally or unintentionally create this star culture. 
Um, it can be very divisive. I've seen it in past lives. And so we've been trying to nurture this and keep tabs on it <coughs> to make sure you know, that we um, have a nice balance between people recognizing that these are the best, they should be rewarded more, but it's not crushing everybody else in their wake. And, and I think that's really important. And one of our big things inside is that we want to be a more human resource to our clients. So I like to take that lens and say, we also want to practice being a more human resource. So how do we treat people well? Everyone should be treated well. Everyone should be given opportunities. But if you're one of our high-flying people, you should be given more and better opportunities than the next person. I, I think that is you know, what a performance culture should be. And it shouldn't... Um, and it shouldn't be even a jealousy factor for others because it's kind of like if, if you're that good, you'll get those as well. It's a way of really fostering excellence among those that, to everybody's potential. Everybody's potential. To, okay. Yeah, contribute at the highest level that you can contribute. And by the way, if you think you're limited where you're doing, maybe you can go and hit higher potential in another role. We're a big company, 57,000 people in almost 40 countries. All right. Thank you. Thanks. And then finally, of course, we need to, here at the Center for Executive Succession, we're always very interested and focused on executive succession. Can you tell us uh, what you think H HR's role is in executive succession? Um, I mean, I think, I think we're, we're significantly involved in executive succession. If I think of the C-suite and maybe there's multiple levels of executives, I think HR plays a key role, frankly, is probably the owner of executive succession. Uh, when it comes to CEO succession, uh, I do believe the right ownership is with the board, but the board needs help. Um, and the board needs help, and, you know, and again, someone like me can help them as long as I'm the right kind of person and I'm trustworthy and, and, and I give them my honest views on either the internal candidates or if they want to look to the outside. But we can help. You know, sometimes these board members don't know the people as well. We can put um, extra rigor around the process so they can get extra information and data. So anyone who's a successor candidate goes through maybe you know, pretty intense battery of tests, you know, just to augment what they know about them. Um, same thing for external candidates. We could help them figure out who are the right search firms to, to choose from. And we could be part of the process, but at the end of the day, it is the board's number one job to select and to keep, you know, the CEO in place. But I think we, we can help them with that, with that directly. Super. Thank yeah. you. Okay. You've listened to another CHRO conversation here at the University of South Carolina. Today, Dermot O'Brien, the CHRO at ADP, provided yet additional evidence and conversation regarding why HR is the function that is required for businesses to succeed in the future. And once again, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Thank I you. I really appreciate it's it. It's fun. Thanks for coming.